Welcome to Mariner's Church and happy Thanksgiving week. I'm so glad you're worshiping with us and I love that online we get to come just as we are from wherever we are. So let's worship together now. This is my story that grace is called my name and love has found a heart and won my soul. This is my anthem, the song upon my heart. Forever I am yours, lost in your love. Come on, say.
out of the wilderness into your deliverance look where I'm standing now in these hands that once were chained and now lifted high in praise look where I'm standing now oh look where I'm standing now Throughout truly my life, I felt like I always believed in God, um, but for me, I didn't know that community was as necessary as I do now. I grew up going to Christmas services at Mariners, and for me, God and church were truly separate. 
When my husband and I got engaged, um, I knew church was something that was really important to him. And I felt like that was something that we were going to start doing together, um, but I wasn't really sure how. So we started going to church service on Sundays, but he decided that he wanted to kind of take it a step further than that um, and thought that we should do Rooted together. Um, and I went into Rooted, honestly kicking and screaming, not thinking that it was something that I needed or that I wanted. Um, but we picked a serve experience with our group. So we felt like doing the Lighthouse Community Center service at Mini Street would be the perfect fit for us. At the 2019 Christmas party, um, I really felt that God put me right where I was supposed to be. I own my own wedding and event coordination company and thought that this could be a really good way for me to give back and plug into the community. After that, I became the senior volunteer coordinator with Lighthouse Community Center's Mini Street. Um, and so now I get to be a part of all of their events. I went from believing in God to truly having a relationship with God. And so much of that came from the community that I didn't know and didn't think that I needed. And I'm so grateful for the experience that I have been given. And now I realize how much that has really changed my life. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship. And if you're watching with us live, please say hi in the chat. We love to say hi to you and see where you're from. And as with every week, we're here to pray with you one on one. And in our heart for community, we want to encourage you to invite your community to join us this Christmas season and to host Christmas in your home. We are putting together a hosting Christmas kit for you that's going to have service invites, kid resources, discussion questions, and some fun Christmas items. So text HOST to the number on the bottom of the screen and join us in hosting Christmas this season. Now, please welcome Kenton Bishore, our Pastor Emeritus, for his legendary Thanksgiving message to enter us into this Thanksgiving season. I love this weekend because this is the last sane moment you have between now and the end of the year. And it's an important moment because what we're all gonna do is we're gonna celebrate Thanksgiving this week. And it'll be different because of COVID. Maybe you'll gather with friends or family or whatever you do. But Thanksgiving's important because it's a time where we stop and we remember and we think back for a whole year. And we take the time to thank God for all of the good things that he gave us. But at the same time, we can feel that there's this tension building, you feel it? because there is the, it's like we're all set up like race cars and right after Thanksgiving is Black Friday. In fact, it's already seemed to have happened. And at that moment, it's like pow and off we go. And in the next 35 days, have you ever stopped to think about what you're gonna do? I mean, you're gonna shop more and buy more than you bought in the last 11 months put together. You're gonna decorate your house, both inside and out. You're gonna buy a tree and decorate it. Uh, there's Christmas parties, they're back. And so you, you know, how many do you wanna go? Even if you're gonna go to a Christmas party, the tension that creates. Then you have all of the great fun part of being with your family and the create, you know, and all the tension that that creates. Your kids are released from school when it seems like they just got back into school. You gotta do all of the year end work and then maybe, because you're not busy enough, you think, well, maybe we should plan a family vacation. And in all this, what we know from research is that we are going to reach the highest levels of stress for the whole year in the next few days. I mean, and we already are at a tipping point. But what's most important to understand is that Christmas is coming and Christmas is something that is worth celebrating. It's important to celebrate it, that God, the creator of the universe, didn't stay distant, but he actually came near, and that he wants, to, he wants us to know who he is, and he wants us to be confident that he understands us. That's so important, and so we've gotta be at a place where we can celebrate Christmas. So today is your last sane moment, and I wanna give you the opportunity to make what I think is the most important decision that you can make, and that is to embrace gratitude, to understand the power of thanksgiving. Now, I've given this message for the last 30 years, and so it's hopefully you'll know it, you'll remember it, because it's that important for us to stop at this point and to really reflect and say, what's going on in my life and in this year? Now, I want you to be clear. As you listen to that, this message, we're gonna do some fun things, but I want you to remember this is not behavioral modification or some self-reformation project. It's not just by simply saying some magic words that all of a sudden it changes you. 
Being thankful is about a condition of your heart. And this is the work that God is doing in your life. We have an opportunity to join God in what he's doing. And as we talk about thankfulness, I don't want you to hear it as being trite. I mean, we are living through COVID. It is a very challenging year. We've been in a series about anxiety and stress, and we understand the pain. And every day we're reminded because we hear about people who have lost their minds and going crazy on airplanes, in restaurants as they're driving. I mean, it's just crazy. So we know that it's a challenging time, but here's the good news that God tells us in his word, that in the most challenging and difficult times, God is working in our hearts to make us into the very people that he wants us to be. It isn't the hard times that changes us. It is the way that we process them with God's grace. And that's really what we're talking about today. And so we're talking about the power of gratitude. So what is the one thing, the one thing that no one has in Orange County? Enough. I mean, we have more. We have more food, we have more things, we have more toys, more possessions, we have more money, but we do not have enough. And we've proven the axiom, the more you have, the more you want, and it never satisfies. And we know why, the Bible tells us why. In the very first story, it tells us what happened because life wasn't always this way. When God created the world, the universe, I mean, everything was good. We lived in loving relationship with God, with each other, and ourselves, we lived in a world of yes. Everywhere we looked, God said, yes. Can I have that? Yes. Can I do this? Yes. Everything was yes, except for at the very center of the garden. There was one tree and the answer was no. And really the whole point of it is at the very center of your life, there's one issue. Will you trust God and do what he says? Or are you gonna trust in yourself and say, no, I want life on my terms? And there's the story, uh, the account of the great temptation. And Satan comes and look at what he does because this shows us why enough is never enough for us. Satan comes to uh, the first couple, comes to Eve and says, did God really say? And what is he doing? He's getting Eve to doubt the truthfulness of God. Is God really telling you the truth? After all, who even decides truth? I mean, don't you get to decide what's true and right? And then the next one, what he says is, um, God is not good. He gives you, uh, Satan gets us to doubt the goodness of God. And this is how he does it. The one thing you don't have is the one thing you need. Satan literally gets Eve to not look at every good thing that God has given, but instead focus on the one thing that you don't have. And then there's the promise. If you got that one good thing, you would be happy. And then the third thing is that he doubts God's trustfulness. He says, you will be like God. You'll be God-like. If you have that, I mean, you don't have to live in humble dependence on God. You will be in control. You'll have everything that you want. And the first couple, Eve makes the decision and they don't trust. But look at what the issue is. The one thing you don't have, I mean, don't look at all the good things you have. God's, the relationships that God has given you, the opportunities that God has given you, the life the family, all the good things God gives you. He says, don't look at that. Focus on the one thing you don't have, that possession, that toy, that car, that relationship. Just focus on that one thing. And there's the promise. If you have that one thing, then you'd really be happy. God's not good. He's not gonna supply it to you. You need to go out and get it. Trust in yourself. You take it. And so the first couple believes that. And as a result of it, they destroy everything. They destroy their relationship with God and then with each other and even themselves. And as a result of that, you see the broken world that we live in and everything's ruined. And so there's selfishness and self-centeredness and jealousy and greed. And there is this inner feeling that we never have enough and we're broken as a result of it. But I know people say, well, you know, I get that for most people, but for me, you know, really, I'm, I'm a grateful person and I don't want a lot, I just want just one more thing. And the question I think you have to ask yourself is what if you got everything that you wanted? I mean, ultimately, if you got everything that you wanted in life, what would that lead to? And you know what I love? The Bible actually answers that question. In the Bible, God records certain stories and those stories, incidences in the lives of God's people are there to teach us the most important lessons in life. So listen to the story that God tells. This is the defining story in the Old Testament. God's people are in slavery and they've been in slavery for hundreds of years. 
if you're enslaved, what's the one thing you want? And you said, if I had that, I would be happy. I'd never want anything else if I could just be free. And so God gives them freedom. But in addition to freedom, he enriches them. He has the Egyptians give them a lot of money. And so they walk out with gold and silver and they're wealthy as a result of it. So they have their freedom and they've been enriched. And so then they cry out and they say, but God, we need you to give us guidance and protection and will you bless us? And so God says, yes, I'll give you that. And so they have it, but then they even want more. And so then they're out in the wilderness and God provides water and food for them every day. And you remember what the food was called in the Old Testament, it's called manna, which literally means, what is it? And it was like a wafer-like substance that appeared on the ground every day. And it had all the nutrients and vitamins that you would need. It was the perfect camping food. And you could grind it up into a powder and you could bake things with it. And so the people, you know, they're camping and they're out in the wilderness with God. And so they're having baked manna and boiled manna, barbecued manna. They're having fried manna. They have manna on a stick, manna burger, manna cotti, manna salad, manna banana, cream pie. I mean, they've made manna every way they can and they get tired of it. And so even though they keep, God keeps giving them more and more, they have their freedom and possessions and protection and everything, they go, but we need just one more thing. And so they said, God, if you would just give us meat, just meat, one day of meat, we would never want anything ever again. That would satisfy us. And so God says, I won't just give you meat for one meal or one day or one week. I'm going to give you meat for a whole month. And he tells Moses to tell the people, and I love Moses' response. What would you say to God? He says, there's 2 million people in the wilderness, and I'm going to give them meat for 2 million, uh, for 2 million people. Moses says, God, even you can't do that. Even you can't pull that off. And the very next day, God flies in quail and he does it for the next month. And the people begin to eat quail. In fact, they gorge themselves on, get, on quail, can't get enough of it. And they eat so much of it, they literally kill themselves. And at the end, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people who die because they're stuffing themselves with quail. And look at what it says in Numbers 11, 34. They ended up calling the place Kibroth Hata'ava, which means the graves of the craving, and they buried the people who craved meat. And then Psalm 106, it tells the story in an artistic way. And it says, God gave them exactly what they asked for, referring to this story. But along with it, he gave them an empty heart. So if you got everything you wanted in life, you end up in a grave of craving and you end up with an empty heart. And really, we can see that all over Orange County. People have more but they never have enough and they keep wanting more and they don't ever have that sense of enoughness, which is really, I have everything that I need. I have everything that I need. They have the feeling of want. So God's great solution for us is gratitude. His antidote for this sense of wanting is the antidote of thanksgiving. Psalm 136 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Do you know what the most repeated statement in all the Bible is? Most people would say, fear not. That's the number one command in the Bible. Or sing a new song. So you always want to give praise to God in a new way. But the most repeated phrase in all the Bible is this one. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. You see how powerful it is? It actually goes against the three lies the first original three lies of Satan. You know, is God really telling you the truth? Give thanks to the Lord. You know, if you give thanks to him, he's telling you the truth. And is God really good? Because God is good and you can trust him. You don't have to trust in yourself because his faithful love endures forever. That phrase, we need it. The reason it's repeated most often in the Bible is because we need to be reminded of it, reminded most often. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. So how many people, what percentage of people do you think are grateful? You think 50% of the people are grateful? 60%, 40%, more or less? What would you guess? Do you know that Jesus actually tells us what percentage of people are grateful? 
He tells a story that actually happened. The Bible, New Testament tells a story where 10 lepers came to Jesus. Now, leprosy was a severe disease. People didn't understand it in the first century. And so as a result of that, they ostracized people. It ended up causing people to lose their hands, their legs, and it disfigured them. It was just a hideous disease. So, you know, it would be, you know, it was a, it was a disease that was a sentence of death. So what would be the one thing if you had leprosy that you'd say, if I could just have one thing, I would never want for anything else. I would always be grateful. It would be to be healed, isn't it? So they came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, would you heal us? And Jesus said, yes, I'll heal you, but this is how it'll work. My part is I'll heal. Now, what you need to do is you need to go to the high priest and you appear before him and somewhere between here and there, I'll heal you. So Jesus' part, he's going to heal. For their part, they have to show their faith and they have to step out. And so they leave. And somewhere between where they met Jesus and before they get to the priest, they're healed. I mean, their skin is transformed. They're healthy. They're new. And we don't know what happens to nine of them, but one of them comes back and he just throws himself at Jesus' feet and says, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. All my life, I've been disfigured. Thank you. And for the first time in my life, I feel whole and healthy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I can be around my family. Thank you. And it's fascinating, Jesus' response. You know what he says? He says, weren't there 10? This is just one. What happened to the other nine? And he asked this question, what would it take for them to be grateful and to give glory to God? And the obvious answer is, They'd have to realize that Jesus is the giver of all good gifts and they'd want to be able to say thank you to Jesus, but they didn't. They just took off and they weren't grateful. And the question we have to ask ourselves is what would it take for us to be grateful? I mean, Jesus is saying about 10% of the people are grateful. I know all of us think, no, I'm grateful. Well, Jesus says only about 10% are. And what it takes to be grateful is to really focus that every good gift is from Jesus and to say thank you is acknowledging that he is the giver of every good gift. So how do we do that? Well, we've got to develop a heart of gratitude. Well, what does that look like? How do you build a thankful heart? Look at what it says in Psalm 100. Enter into God's presence or with the password, thank you. You know, all of us have passwords and passwords we have to protect the most important things in our life. And Everything that's valuable has a password. And this genius to a good password is that it's gotta be not predictable and it's gotta be memorable. And we have so many passwords, we can't remember them all and that we get lost in them. Well, God's presence is incredibly valuable. And even God's presence has a password. What's the password into God's presence? Thank you. I mean, it says literally the way we come into God's presence. Maybe you remember it if you've grown up in the church this way. It says, we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. We enter into God's presence by simply saying thank you. It grants us access to God. So what do thankful people say? They say thank you. And we know that. We understand it. Now, I'm not talking about it when somebody just mindlessly says thank you and it doesn't reflect really the attitude of their heart. But when you stop and you really reflect and you remember that everything that you have is a good gift from God, and when you say thank you, it doesn't matter if you say it to a person or any place in life, ultimately, when you say thank you, you are saying thank you to God. We know that it does something powerful to our souls. It heals our hearts and it's important. And we know it's important because what does every parent teach their kid to say? To say thank you. You know, you... You know, you, you get it. I remember as a kid, I wanted a basketball. My aunt gave me a globe and I opened it and I was ready to say, a globe? who wants a globe? And my mom grabbed me by the back of the neck and said, what do you say? And I was expected to say, thank you. Because we want our kids to learn the importance of saying thank you and acknowledging that God is the one who gives us every good gift. So what do people say? They say, thank you. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to practice it. And it isn't that it's a magical word. It's just the idea of in our heart, when we become grateful, it heals our soul. It transforms us. So think about it and just say it with me. So when you taste something that's really good and you realize 
God didn't have to make things taste good and he didn't have to give you taste buds, but he did because he's that fun of a God. And so when you taste something that's really good, you can't help but say, thank you, right? So say thank you. When you wanna do something and your body works, you wanna move your hands, you wanna move your legs, and you realize that it, your body is functioning right, you can't help but say, thank you. You know, when you read a book or you're talking to somebody and you're in a conversation and you realize that your mind is following along and you're able to think new thoughts, you go, thank you to God. Uh, when you see the, a sunrise or a sunset or the beauty of creation and it inspires you because you see God's power and majesty, you can't help but say thank you. When your heart beats over 100,000 times a day and your lungs fill with air and without even thinking about it, can't help but say thank you. When you realize that you don't have to live in Wisconsin, you can't help but say thank you because that is a good thing. And so what we've done is every year we kind of look at what is a good definition? So as a church, we have a fun definition about what thankfulness is. Before I get to that, first of all, look at what Romans says. What is this leading spiritual indicator in your life? What, what determines which way spiritually you are going? Look at this verse. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. So now what happens when we don't give thanks to God? And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. You know, when we're grateful, it repairs our soul. We live in a world of light. When we are ungrateful, literally, it brings darkness to our own hearts and we become hideous and we start to complain. And so we're either moving towards God with gratitude or we're moving away from God with ungratefulness. And a good way to think about it is just take this little quiz with me. How many of you in the last week have complained or been ungrateful or you've whined about something. Now I'll give you a list and it gives you a way just to think, have I been ungrateful? So this last week, have you complained about money or the markets or the government or about COVID or vaccines or wearing masks? Have you complained about your weight or your in-laws? Have you complained about your in-laws money or weight? Have you complained about the traffic or weather? You complained about the spouse you have or don't have, the kids that you have, or don't have? Have you complained about your opportunities, your house, your car, if you've complained about anything? Have you complained? <laughs> Most people would say, yeah, I've complained. Well, you know what the Bible says? When you complain, you're moving closer to hell and you smell like smoke. And you're bringing darkness to your own life and you bring that darkness into your family and your friendships and your workplace and everything that is important. And so studies show how important thankfulness is. And I love it when researchers study something and they find out that what God says has been true all along. So these Harvard researchers did a massive study on thankfulness. First of all, they had to determine what is a thankful person. So they studied it, did all this stuff, and they drew a line and they said, now here's what thankfulness, this is what researchers say, so you can disagree with it, but here's the line. So either you are grateful or you're not grateful. Remember, Jesus said only about 10% are grateful. So here's how they identified a grateful person. A grateful person is a person who sits down and just takes a moment to reflect and they write down three things that they're grateful for twice a day. So they write down six things that they're grateful for throughout the day. So two times, three things. And then here's the key, they share it. They share it with someone. So quick quiz. Are you grateful if, or if you sit down and write 10 things for which you're grateful? No, not unless you share it. You have minimally have to identify six things for which you're grateful, and then you have to share it. So there's the line. If you don't do that, you're not grateful. Remember, Jesus said 90% of the people are not grateful. Now, here's what's amazing, and this is what I love. Why would you want to make a list of three things that you're grateful for twice a day or write six and then share it throughout the day? He goes, here's what they found out. Literally, when you're grateful, it reprograms your mind and it's for free. You're more creative, more energetic. You're more optimistic, more socially connected. When you're thankful, you earn more, you live longer, you're more forgiving, you're more generous, you're more joyful, and you're better looking. The last one I made up, that's not true, but all the other ones are true. And so the Bible says when we're grateful, we actually enter into God's presence. So even though the studies show the magnitude of gratitude, here's what I love. 
Guys, here, pay attention, guys. It's harder for us. You know why it's harder? Just try to say it, guys. If you're a guy, say thank you. See how you can't even do it? And the reason that it is, the study said, is that when a guy says thank you, he feels more indebted and obligated and literally creates anxiety. So here's why, as a guy, you should be grateful. When a guy expresses gratitude, he gets an even greater return than women do. So you're even more creative, energetic, optimistic, more forgiving, more joy, joyful. I mean, it gives us a greater return. And I read a study that during the pandemic, people who were grateful, it actually was a healing force and it made people, they were less anxious, less depressed, and uh, it helped them in uh, dealing with substance abuse. So thankfulness is a healing force. So who's responsible for your thankfulness quotient? You know, your spouse, your family, your boss? No, the obvious answer is I am. I'm responsible. So our definition as a church, every year we, I remind you of it, sort of a fun working definition. What is a thankful person? A thankful person is a person who wants what they have. Look at what it says in Thessalonians. Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So God's will is that we are thankful. There's a story in uh, first, Second Chronicles 20 that shows the power of thankfulness. Uh, God told the king Jehoshaphat, there was a foreign army coming in and he was terrified. And he says, this is the way I want you to fight the battle. Imagine this, God says, I want you to put a group of people out in front of the army that just sing praises and yell out thanksgiving to God and you watch what I do. And those people that went out in front and were just thankful, they literally conquered an army and they defeated the dark. There is a lot of darkness in our lives. I mean, COVID has brought stress and anxiety and confusion. People have suffered loss and pain. There's relationships that are broken. Um, people, there's so much de divisiveness in our society and you, you just get a sense of tiredness of it. So what defeats the darkness ultimately? You can only feed, defeat the darkness with the light of gratitude in your heart. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. So thankfulness is wanting what I have because everything I have is a gift from God. And so you have to look at it. Now, this is way different than the world's message because during this next season, you're gonna have all sorts of advertisements, pop-ups on the computer and everything delivered to you that says, you know, whatever you have, it should be better. I mean, you look at your car, your apartment, your clothes, your furniture, anything that you have, Basically, it should be better. Uh, it could be better. You deserve better. There's just one more thing that would make your life better. And so during this season, you have to discipline yourself to think a different way. And so what we wanna do is just embrace this ideal of thankfulness and saying, I want what I have. So what does it look like? So today, when you go out to your car, and you, you, know, you come up to it and ironically, you're gonna walk up to your car, you'll see all of its dings. It'll probably be sitting there kind of on its tires, just looking tired. And, I, and ironically, right next to it will be the car of your dreams. But what you're gonna do is walk up to your car, grab the handle and go, I want my car. It couldn't be better. See, it's wanting what I have. You open up your closet, look at your clothes. They're out of date and, you know, don't make you look slick or, you know, quick or anything. And you're going to say, just say it out loud. You know what? I love my clothes. They couldn't be better. You're going to walk into your workplace and see all the people that you work with, all those clowns that do all these interesting things. And you're gonna walk into your workplace and go, I love the people that I work with. They couldn't be better. You're gonna look at your body in the mirror when you get up, the body that God's given you and say, I love my body. It couldn't be better, <laughs> right? You're gonna look at your spouse, your wife, your kids, your husband, say, I love the people in my life. They couldn't be better because you know who the most thankful people in the world are? They're coffee drinkers. Because when you look at a coffee drinker, you see the beauty of what a thankful heart really looks like. Because they wake up in the morning and they stumble down either their, to their kitchen or they go to their coffee shop and they get that first cup of coffee and they just hold it in their hands because it's like their own private little fireplace.
and they just smell the aroma for a minute or two because it is one of God's greatest gifts. And they just sit there anticipating the very first sip and they take the very first sip of coffee and they go, ah. And really that's what a grateful person says. They say, ah. They look at their car and they go, ah. They look at the people in their life, the people that God's given them and they go, ah. They look at the clothes that they have that are out of date and they go, Ah, they look at their body in the mirror, the body that God's given them, and they go, ah, right? They look at their spouse in the morning, now be careful, and they go, ah, because that's what does, that's what God's given us. So thankful people want what they have. And contented people, here's our definition of contentment, they don't want any more. And here's how you remember it. Who's more content, the man with five kids or the man with $50 million? And the obvious answer is the man with five kids because he, he doesn't want any more. And that's what contentment is. Contentment is not wanting any more. Look at what it says in Philippians. I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. Contentment is something that we have to learn. It's not something that we're born with. Nobody is content. All of us are discontent. All of us think that we have to have uh, more and we don't have enough. And over the next days, marketeers are going to work so hard to deliver one message to you. You need it. They're going to give you catalogs and advertisements. There's going to be things you didn't even know existed. And there's one message. You need it. So to be content, you've got to sort of shout at the world and say, I don't need it. So just practice with me. All right. So when you uh, see that gadget, you know, a drone or that new surfboard or that new, you know, new camping gear or whatever it is. And you think you're just going to look at it and say, I don't need it. When you see that new car that you've always wanted and a model is draped across the hood and it's in the perfect color, you're going to say, I don't need it. When you see those clothes that are so slick looking and they'd make you look younger and smarter and better, you can just say with passion, I don't need it. When you watch the do-it-yourself network and you see the new kitchen, the new bathroom, the new whatever it is, you say, I don't need it. When you go golfing with your friend and he's got the new you know, hyper light driver that's got titanium and space alloy and you hit that, and it goes 50 yards further than you've ever hit it before, and it's straight, and you hold it in your hand, you're going to hand it back to him and say, <laughs> oh, no, I might need that, right? No, you say, I don't need it. And, you know, the question is, if I gave Lori one day of shopping, unlimited shopping at Fashion Island, she could buy whatever she want one day, would she be happy? We'll never know. And you know what's ironic is that during this season, the lottery is going to reach its all-time high. It's going to go over, it's going to be over a half a billion dollars because we all have this magical thought that if we just had a half a billion dollars, that's what we need to make our happy, to make ourselves happy. But when you go up to a counter and they say, you want to buy a lottery ticket and it's for over a half a billion dollars, you're going to say, I don't need it. Because if you needed a half a billion dollars, your heavenly father loves you so much he'd give you a half a billion dollars. But the reason that he doesn't is because if you had it, it would ruin you and nobody would like you. So he doesn't give you a half a billion dollars. So look at what it says. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. And so you just got to make that commitment to say every day, I'm going to make a list of things for which I'm grateful, at least six. I got to share it two times a day. I got to say it out loud. Look at Philippians 4. We looked at this a few weeks back. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition. So we're not supposed to be anxious, but in every situation, we just tell God what we need, but we do it with a thankful heart, with thanksgiving. And so you present your request to God and then, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. Isn't that what we need? We need the peace of God in this crazy COVID world. The one thing that we need is the peace of God. You know, David in Psalm 103 models writing out a list of being a thankful person. He says, let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget 
the good things that he's done for me. And in that Psalm, he makes a list. And so if you want to know some things that, you know, would be good to be grateful for, go to Psalm 103 and look at it. But here's what you can do. And this isn't just a self-reformation project. This is really joining in the work that God is doing in your life every day for this next season. Will you just sit down and just, in, just takes a minute and write down three things that you're grateful for in the morning and then sometime in the afternoon, three things for which you're grateful and then just share them. And I'll show you how easy it is. This morning I said, you know, I'm grateful for Lori. I love her. She's a great companion in life. We're having so much fun together. Uh, I, my health, I love that I'm healthy and I love my grandkids and all the relationships. And see, I just told you what they were. And then the second list that I made in the afternoon, I love the work that I get to do these days. I get to coach pastors. You know what else I'm grateful for? I love Eric and how he's led our church this last year. This has been absolutely the most difficult year I've ever seen in a church to lead well. And I love how Eric has led us because he's focused on Jesus when everybody wants to focus on everything else. And then I love just seeing the life change in the church. So see, there's my list. I'm a grateful person. Don't you want to join me? And you just make a list. You just have to say it because walking with Jesus is about living a life of gratitude. Anytime you say thank you, you are coming into the presence of God and you're acknowledging that every good gift is from God and it transforms your heart. Don't you wanna be a grateful person? Yes, you do. Pray with me. Father, we are so grateful that really walking with you isn't hard. And in this next season, would you guard our hearts and give us your peace? as we embrace thankfulness. You're a good God who loves to give good gifts and we're gonna take the time to embrace those and say thank you every day. Thank you, thank you for the good things you give us and most of all for your love and the freedom that we have in Jesus. And it is his name we pray, amen.
Just before the benediction, one thing that I would encourage you to do, and I think one of the best ways to express our gratitude and to say thank you to God is by just, and it's the way he gave us, is by giving back to him. He's given us everything. And when we give, it creates a freedom in our life. God, you're the giver and I'm going to trust you. I know that you're good and I know that your faithful love endures forever. I'm never going to be failed by you. You're always going to take care of me. Giving is such a powerful expression of trusting in a good God who gives good gifts and that he's good all the time. You can see on the screen the different ways that you can give. Join me. It is the great thrill of life. Hold out your hands and receive God's blessing. Father, look at your children. They love you. Would you bless them? Would you keep them? Would you cause your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them? Would you lift up the light of, count, of your countenance? Would you turn your attention towards them when they cry out? And would you rescue and deliver and save? And God, would you give them your peace? We ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have a great day.